So next we have up uh, Gil Brindley and Joe Stannis from the Iowa DOT and Gil Brindley's from UHPC Solutions North America. I'm going to be talking about uh, UHPC overlays. Hi, I'm Joe Stannis. I'm the Iowa DOT Bridge Preservation Engineer, and I'm going to let Gil start off the presentation here. Hello, uh, my name is Gil Brindley. I'm the director for UHPC Solutions. Uh, I apologize if some of you have been through some of my presentations before. You'll see the familiarity in some of these slides. So uh, just a quick intro, uh, UHPC Solutions is a joint venture formed by two contractors. One is a U.S.-based contractor out of the New York metropolitan market, Pasilico. They're about a $500 million uh, co uh, general contractor, heavy highway. And uh, Wallow, Bershinger AG, which is a Zurich-based European uh, general contractor, heavy infrastructure there, about a billion dollar uh, company that works uh, across Europe. Uh, we had partnered up with these guys about five years ago to uh, take some of the innovation that we saw in Europe, specifically around ultra high performance concrete and bring those uh, solutions over to the United States. Um, so for those of you who don't know, UHPC is a, a concrete material, but it's different from regular concrete. So I like to explain it um, like uh, concrete on a micro scale. So instead of having rebar uh, that you could physically see and measure, it has steel fibers in it. Instead of having aggregate that's in normal concrete, your, small, your largest particle in UHPC is sand. So there's no aggregate, there's sand and everything smaller, uh, admixtures in water. What that allows you to do is it creates this impermeable layer. UHPC is impervious to salts and chlorides. It is 100% waterproof. It has a disconnected pore structure. So when you do have any type of uh, um, material that wants to try to get down through the UHPC into something else, it cannot transmit in there. The steel fibers that are at the surface, if they're sticking out of the surface, they will rust, but the rust will only go down about a 16th of an inch and then it'll arrest. It'll stop because there's no place for air and water to get further in to uh, continue that corrosion reaction. Uh, it hits a uh, strength of about uh, somewhere between 25,000 and 35,000 pounds per square inch. Um, it uh, has an exceptional uh, durability, 75-year um, life cycle, and um, the added bonus is because of those fibers in there, you have some tensile strength in UHPC that you would not have in normal concrete. It's only been about the last 10 years that we've been using UHPC in the United States. It started out being used for uh, joint fill and shear keys. Um, over the last about five years, we've gotten into overlays and uh, have, have found that UHPC overlays, a thin lift UHPC overlay of uh, two inches or less, uh, can be an alternative to a full deck replacement as long as the uh, existing uh, deck condition is in um, decent shape. Uh, what I'm saying is that you don't want to be trying to put an overlay on a deck that is blowing out through the bottom. You have lots of chlorides in the bottom mat of rebar. Um, that probably is a little too far for a, uh, a UHPC overlay. The basic concept is you can either put it in as a, a waterproofing, which is, is that inch and a quarter overlay uh, on top of um, the existing rebar mat, or you can go down uh, through the top mat of rebar and you could actually add additional rebar to it and change it from a uh, waterproofing layer into a structural layer, which uh, changes the uh, strength characteristics of the structure. In Europe, they typically uh, use uh, asphalt as a riding surface. They think it's quieter, uh, it's easier to deal with, uh, but in the US, we like the, uh, the exposed surface, so you can do either one. You can grind and groove UHPC uh, just like you would any other uh, type of bridge deck, uh, but you can't tine this as you're placing it because if you try tining it while you're placing it, you're basically just ripping up all the fibers uh, as you're dragging across the surface. So we're really here to talk about the project, uh, the 163 project in, uh, in, in Iowa. Uh, Joe's going to cover the, the owner's perspective and then I'll circle back on some of the UHPC issues. The project I'm going to share with you today, it's located on State Highway 163 eastbound. It's a four-lane divided highway. Uh, just southeast of the Des Moines metro area. Uh, the existing bridge is a 95 foot by 44 foot pretension, pre-stressed uh, concrete beam bridge that was built in 1974. The first, over, or when we first concepted this in 2017, we were gonna put a PCC overlay on this and then in 2019 we updated that to UHPC. Uh, the original deck, the thickness we're dealing with was seven and a half inches. 
Uh, traffic on this section of the roadway, we're looking at just under 13,000 vehicles in both directions, about half of that on this bridge. Um, we got the overlay installed late summer, early um, fall of 2020, and the UHPC nominal thickness was an inch and a quarter. Let's get into why, the, why we used UHPC. Um, I was piloting UHPC as a possible long-term solution for areas that um, are not easily accessible from a traffic perspective, um, where we have a hard time getting back to do maintenance. Our goal has been to do one UHPC overlay at least every year to two years is what we're shooting for. Um, looking to gain experience in gathering data and performance history on the product and develop some confidence with the product that it's going to last a long time. Um, the, so the location of the project that is kind of in the middle of the state and uh, made it nice for looking at the performance of it. We can get to it easily, uh, short travel distance. We also chose this as a smaller bridge too with the cost of UHPC that helped us keep our cost down on this. So now I'll go through the steps of how the overlay was installed. Um, construction was done in two stages with one lane of traffic kept going at all times. We initially milled the deck and prepped for hydro demolition. And then hydro demolition was used to roughen the deck surface. And also the hydro demolition did a nice job of removing all the shallow, shallow repair areas. There's very small amount of hand work, hand chipping that had to be done after that. Uh, indirect benefit is we also had some really clean rebar after the hydro demo process. The UHPC was site batched on the west end of the bridge, just a couple hundred feet from the end of the bridge. The material was delivered to the deck using concrete buggies, and then UHP Solutions installed the overlay with the placing and finishing machine that they had specifically built for UHPC. Hand finishing was done off the deck on the back of the finishing machine. Spray on curing compound was then applied, and then plastic sheeting was put on top for cure. Longitudinal grooving was done at the end of the project. We had an out-of-state subcontractor to do the longitudinal grooving, and he only wanted to mobilize once. So that meant we were open in stage one, tra one up to traffic prior to it being longitudinally grooved. And what the contractor chose to do was to shot blast the surface, and then we tested that for skid resistance, and it worked out fine for a temporary situation. So two year, we're about two years old on the overlay now. Um, no issues to date. Seen no signs of cracking, no signs of spalling. It's been performing well. As Gil mentioned, there's the fibers at the very top of the surface do tend to corrode, and it gives it a little bit of a reddish hue to the deck, but um, it's performing well. So Iowa DOT's future plans with UHPC include continuing to gather infield data on our two bridges that we've overlaid with UHPC. Uh, we also plan to construct a two-course deck. Uh, it's actually a brand new bridge next year in 2023. We're going to do with a two-course deck and the top course is going to be UHPC. And our thoughts there, hopefully, once that overlays down from day one, we don't have to touch that bridge for a very long time. We're also going to continue to participate in ongoing UHPC research, including development of non-proprietary mixes. And in conjunction with the research, continue the goal to try to do one overlay every year to two years. And some more photos of the project. Well, this, I'll turn it back to Gil. Yeah, so a couple things I'll, I'll uh, tell you about in the, um, in the project. In that upper uh, left-hand photo, that is our, our batching plant. Uh, we use model 54, uh, 54 cubic foot mixers, a pair of them. Normally, you want to have two mixers out there, so if you have a problem, you can still batch uh, concrete. Uh, the upper right-hand photo is the um, thin lift UHPC paver. Uh, it does not work like a, a bridge finisher. Um, you can't take a, like a rotating drum over the top of UHPC because it just grabs onto the fiber and just throws it all over the place and tears up the surface. So it's, uh, it's paved much like a slip former. So this is just a slip former that's on a flat surface. It has high vibration. One of the things about UHPC is that when you, um, it comes in two different formulas. There's a joint fill formula, which is self-consolidating, uh, self-leveling, very, very liquid. Um, goes wherever the lowest point is on the bridge. And then we have overlay formula, which has to be a lot thicker because it's got to hold a slope, whether that's a curl slope or a, a, a longitudinal slope on the, on the bridge. So they use um, the, the formula is slightly different for an overlay. It's called a thixotropic mix or a thixotropic material, which means when you um, put it down on the deck, 
and you just leave it alone, it sits there and it holds a slope. When you vibrate it and start adding energy to it, it smooths out. Once you take the energy off of it, it holds the slope again. So that's essentially what's that, what that uh, paver does is it, it screeds down the UHPC and vibrates the top surface and through uh, down into the UHPC so that it will consolidate around rebar or whatever you're placing it on. The uh, cure time for a UHPC overlay is in um, 48 hours to 72 hours. Of course, that's depending on temperature, just like a lot of other concrete. Um, it'll hit about 11,000 PSI in that uh, two days or uh, three days, which is typically the um, strength requirement in order to load the deck. So if you have to, you're going to put traffic on it, you're going to have to hit 11,000. Before you can put your grinder groover on it, you need to hit 11,000 PSI. Uh, if you use UHPC for a joint fill, um, that speeds up the curing time, and you could get 12,000 PSI in about 12 hours, depending on the formula you use and, and, and what your conditions are. A couple of success factors for this project, obviously surface preparation. Uh, hydro demolition is a great uh, technique for removal of all damaged concrete, weaker concrete. The hydro demolition robots don't know any, they're stupid. They just push water at a very high pressure at the deck and whatever is weaker comes out. That's great for owners who have, who wanna make sure that they have a really good substrate to put an overlay on, any type of overlay. In this case, we did some milling first. Um, milling is also a good way for removal. It's cheaper than hydro demolition, but you have to remember in milling that it is striking the surface of that concrete deck and it will leave micro fractures that could go about a half inch deep. So the best combination we found is milling and then uh, hydro demolition or hydro scarification after to make sure you don't have any cracks in that existing substrate. Efficient mixing, you have to time all this so that ev and everything has to be sized right. If your paver is a certain width and you have to do a certain width of placement at a certain depth, you're gonna have to make sure that you have enough yardage on the deck to keep up with the paver or uh, either way. I mean, your paver has a speed, your mixing has a speed, your buggies are transferring, so you have to put that whole system together to make sure it all works. Curing is really important. We used uh, curing compound and plastic on this job. Uh, when you're on an elevated bridge, the plastic doesn't work so well because the wind picks it up and blows it all over the place, and you really can't put anything down on top of the plastic to hold it down. We have taken water and sprayed it on the plastic on top of a new UHPC placement and the water will depress the UHPC. During that first, those first like six to eight hours when it's still in a plastic state, you really can't put anything on there. If you need concrete blankets, you better wait 24 hours before you put concrete blankets on it or it'll dent your surface. Um, you get a nice clean surface and then you wanna come back and, and uh, grind and groove it. Um, why do you grind and groove it? Because the placement, this stuff is very finicky material. It, it likes, when it decides it's gonna set up, it sets up where it is. So you end up with some little roll in it when you place an overlay that you wanna take out with grinding and grooving so that you have the good rideability. A couple of the projects that we're um, working on now, some larger projects, the Delaware Memorial Bridge, we did a pilot project in 2020 and did three small sections. And they decided to move forward with the whole um, northbound bridge. It's a 5,000 cubic yard UHPC job. Uh, we're currently in the first uh, season of that and uh, doing one quarter of the bridge. We're about three placements from finishing up all the UHPC on that. And we're on a very long grinding, grooving pr uh, process, like two weeks of grinding and grooving to get all that done. Uh, we built some custom batch plants for this. We're able to put out, a, uh, out of a batch plant about 12 yards an hour. Uh, which is really nice. One of the other projects we worked on was the Commodore Barry Bridge, another East Coast bridge. Um, I, you know, I show you these because I think that as, as other large structure owners see um, how these projects perform, they're looking at solutions, and one of those um, that they're entertaining is UHPC. So I, I think we'll continue to see more larger projects with UHPC overlays in the future. I've got a bunch of other uh, Lessons learned from a contractor's perspective, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll spare you on that. And uh, if you want to stop by our, our uh, booth this evening, I can answer any questions you have. Did you say you were going to try a bridge deck poured in two lifts? Correct. So the bottom will be traditional concrete, and then the top will be UHPC? Be an 8-inch HPC deck, and then we'll um, hydro-demo the top of that, and then an inch and a quarter 
of UHPC on top. Okay, so you're gonna pour yep. regular bridge deck concrete. Correct. Then hydro it. Yep. Okay. Quarter inch. That was what that was what I was getting at. I wasn't sure what the bond and surface profile was right. that you were gonna have between uh, uh, freshly poured concrete and uh, UHPC. So, thanks. So a couple. You had to grind the deck because you can't tine it. The gutter line. Typically, we have trouble getting the grinder in there. Do you have a wavy gutter line that doesn't enable water flow? I wouldn't say we end up with a problem with the gutter line. I mean, we'll hand grind the gutter line to make sure it's consistent with the rest of the surface. Use like a walk behind grinder. Okay, and then other question was the testing. You know, when we used UHPC, we had to have a specialty lab machine the cylinders or the cubes or whatever. And if you're trying to verify breaks in 48 hours for open to traffic, how was that managed? Sure, there's a couple of different ways. I mean, right now the industry is, is entertaining using thermal couples as um, uh, a, a way to verify the strength of a, a, a bridge deck placement or a bridge placement, concrete placement. So thermal couples are remote sensors that record temperature. And for any concrete mix, you could um, set the curve and say when it reaches a certain temperature, that means it's gonna hit this PSI. So we put thermal couples in to verify what's going on uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the actual deck, and then we make cylinders. Now the cylinders are gonna break over 10,000 PSI very shortly, so you need a special type of uh, compressive strength machine, and you need uh, it, what they call an end grinder. End grinders cost about $30,000 for a lab to buy one of these. Uh, you can put a series of cylinders in them. They're little uh, three by six cylinders and it will grind the ends of them completely uh, perpendicular to the shaft of the um, cylinders so that when you do break it, it doesn't have any sort of uneven surface where it wants to break uh, prematurely. Um, but that's, that's pretty much the testing we do on site. We will also do um, a flow test, a, a static and dynamic flow test. It's a little bump table that you kind of crank this wheel and peel this thing off and take a measurement flows anywhere from four inches to eight inches. Hey, Lance Mulberry of Dickinson County. Hey, um, is that rust coming through the deck? That picture you showed with the red deck. And if there's that rust, how are you keeping the water out so it doesn't pop when it freezes? So the, uh, that is rust. That is the steel fibers that are rusting off until they are gone. And uh, there's no place for the water to go. It can't go any place. It can't get into the deck because there's no pores for it to get into the deck. Now, if we, if we left a hole in the deck, let's say we had a place where UHPC didn't go in and left an air void, theoretically the air void could fill up with water, the water could freeze, but the, the strength of the UHPC is about 25,000 PSI, so you're, not, you're gonna have the water give up before the UHPC gives up. Does that answer your question? Rust is expansive, so when the rust is expanded. Absolutely. Yeah, but the rust doesn't go through, it, it stops right at the surface. And it, it, doesn't, it can't continue that reaction because rust, the corrosive reaction needs water, it needs salt, it needs that metal, and it needs some oxygen. So if there's no way for water and oxygen to get in there, it doesn't continue that process. I may have missed this, but what's the weather limitations of, of placing this concrete? Generally, like most other concrete, you wanna be uh, 50 degrees um, and rising. So if you're much colder than that, you're going to have problems with it. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.